Welcome back, everyone. We have two very exciting discussions now on the sessions area. You will learn how can we preserve the Palestinian identity using NFTs. This workshop introduces the Anftine project, which aims to preserve a part of the Palestinian legacy and history by converting the Palestinian currency to a non-fungible token or NFT. So if you are interested to learn about the power of blockchain and how it can be used, to preserve the Palestinian identity, join the workshop now with Hamza Roche, the founder and CEO at Naviatics, the Middle East's first mobility analytics uh, platform that transforms uh, raw location and car data from smartphones into actionable insights. Also, Rakan Abbasi, the co-founder and the CMO at Aizin Startup that aims to empower the consumers to make uh, grocery uh, shopping uh, decisions by revealing the best prices in the local market. On the main stage, we'll be discussing impact investing. This panel comes together to discuss the importance of establishing an impact fund in Palestine and how this would help accelerate the growth and impact on social enterprises in Palestine. How does an impact fund differ from existing funds in Palestine and how can you be part of this? Let me welcome Mary Nazal Batainen, the chairperson and owner of the 17 Ventures and Landmark Hotel in Amman, and an impact investor who will be moderating this important discussion. She was chosen as Jordan's top businesswoman in 2019 and as one of Forbes' uh, most powerful Arab women for several years. Mary is a young global le leader of the World uh, Economic Forum. Uh, a qualified barrister and uh, a political social just, uh, uh, justice activist. So let me welcome Mary. Hello, Mary. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Sassabil, and thank you to all the organizers for this amazing event. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm your moderator for today. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that we have amazing interpretation, live interpretation uh, available. So please follow the instructions on the chat to find it. Uh, our discussion today will last 45 minutes and we will dedicate the last 10 minutes to Q&A. Please send your questions in the chat and we will make sure to get to them. So as mentioned, our panel today is entitled Impact Investing, Getting Started in, Pan in, in Palestine. So our panelists are, everyone knows Lama Amar, she needs no introduction, the Executive Director of Build Palestine. And the two other speakers I've known for a few years, Omar Itani, general manager at Fabric Aid, an inspirational social entrepreneur who is looking to flip the script, and he will explain how. And finally, Amin Gharayeb, a consultant at Al Fanar Venture Philanthropy, who has led the design of an impact fund that he will tell you about in a significantly thoughtful way, and he has excellent insight into the potential of impact investing in the region. So before we jump into the discussion, you may be thinking, what does impact investing have to do with building Palestine and with building for unity? I mean, does it really seem relevant? You could be asking yourself that. In my opinion, it absolutely is. Because one of the key questions in the midst of a struggle is how do we not lose sight of the society that we want to build? And for me, the way we build businesses and the way we invest money is part and parcel to how we build or evolve a community. There are so many Palestinian startups that I have seen, impact-driven companies by incredible social entrepreneurs solving a social or environmental problem. They should be on the radar of impact capital. Impact capital, by definition, should be going to places and communities that need it the most, to underserved areas. If Palestine does not fit this definition, I do not know what does. And one of the reasons that I got involved in the global impact investment space a few years ago is to get Palestinian voices heard. It is up to us as Palestinians in the diaspora as well as Palestinian entrepreneurs 
and conscious people in the region and beyond to make our voices heard in the impact investment space. And more importantly, work intentionally to build our economy with those values. Of course, given the occupation and the apartheid regime, this task becomes even more difficult. But is it impossible? Let us turn to our panelists to find out. So starting, of course, with Lama. Lemma, you are working on the ground. You know the entrepreneurship scene. Give us a bird's eye view of the ecosystem in Palestine at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for all the speakers today uh, who joined our panel to let us know more about impact investment and the importance of having impact investing in Palestine. So uh, if you don't know, I'm talking to everyone now, uh, at Build Palestine, we work with social enterprises. An example of social enterprises are the, uh, the Build Palestine fellows that if you have visited the expo, you might have seen some of the examples. And all the videos we have been showing in the uh, breaks, these are examples of social enterprises that solve social or environmental challenges in an innovative way. Um, and when I just wanted to clarify what do we mean with the social enterprise before I dive into the scene, I'm talking about businesses um, that combine financial and also social goals in the business itself. However, they prefer the interest of people and planet over the gains of shareholders. So technically speaking, they're making profit. Uh, but we call the profit surplus, and the surplus is reinvested in the business to maximize the impact. And to give an, an, the scene in Palestine, we do not have a legal framework that supports this kind of social enterprises. However, we still do work with social enterprises that take other formats, and we're working on uh, with what's on the ground for now. So some of them are registered as companies, some of registered are registered as charities, Cooperatives is actually is the closest legal format for social enterprises in Palestine. So we work with what we have, but we do have multiple social enterprises in Palestine. So but to, to just take a, a zoom out uh, on the, the overall situation, the whole social entrepreneurship scene is relevantly new in Palestine. We have many social projects and initiatives, and, and it's in people's blood in Palestine to do good. Um, however, I'm talking about the format of of having a business with social purpose and you preferring the you know, benefit of people and planet over the financial gains. And I, I'm, I mean, one of the first things that we do at Build Palestine is spreading awareness about social entrepreneurship because in most cases, when I meet social entrepreneurs, they don't know they're social entrepreneurs. I, I think we have many social entrepreneurs in Palestine who do not identify as social entrepreneurs because simply they do not know. And why is that? It's because there is lack of support to social entrepreneurs in Build Palestine. I say this always that, unfortunately, Build Palestine is one of the few actors in this space. We need way more organizations, support systems to help social entrepreneurs identify themselves and receive the proper support to help them validate their impact, but also scale their impact. And because I got to the scaling part now and why um, we were having this panel today is that I have been working with social entrepreneurs for the last four years now. And um, I, I get inspired every day uh, with these amazing uh, social entrepreneurs in Palestine, in West Bank, in Gaza, in Jerusalem in 1948. But I have to say Gaza is definitely my favorite. The most innovative solutions come out of Gaza. And these entrepreneurs work day and night to prove the impact that they have. However, they, at some point, hit a wall. And that wall is, unfortunately, most of the time, is funding. The available resources for funding for social entrepreneurs in Palestine are very limited. And like the whole investing scene in Palestine, even tech startups with high growth potential, also face difficulties in securing investment, especially because they are Palestinian, and we only have one uh, VC in Palestine. However, it becomes more difficult when it's a social entrepreneur that does not meet the expectations of an ordinary uh, investor who expects really high returns, um, it becomes really difficult. The only available resources are you know, an award, a prize here and there, 
$10,000, $5,000, which usually help the entrepreneur survive for the, the moment, but they do not help them build a reliable structure to scale their impact to other Palestinian cities and in many cases to other countries. Because I do believe that in Palestine, we have so many challenges that we share with the rest of the world and we do can, we can export many solutions from Palestine. So this is when the idea came that it is time. We have to prepare for the future. The entrepreneurs are growing and we do have few of them ready in, investment ready. And it's time to start thinking to channel some of these investments to social entrepreneurs and to be patient with them to accomplish social milestones, but also be financially sustainable. And this is why we were having this panel today. No, oh, thank you. That's so useful. And I think you made a very important point that Palestinian entrepreneurs often by default are solving a social or envir environmental problem, especially given the context within which they operate. But they no may not fit that actual Western definition by the gin on you know, what a social enterprise is. And it's about building capacity, maybe when it comes to what is your impact management and measurement systems in place? How can you actually uh, determine what impact you're having? What are the goals? What are the metrics? And so on. And that speaks to the lack of an overall impact economy infrastructure that we're also trying to build in Jordan, which provides a safety net and guidance for social entrepreneurs, which is so important. Talking about social entrepreneurs, Ahmad, I'd love you to jump in introduce yourself, introduce Fabric Aid. I mean, you're really here today as an inspiration to many of the social entrepreneurs that, you know, maybe listening and thinking, gosh, you know, doing business in Palestine is difficult enough. How can I really make a business that, you know, makes money and does good at the same time? Can you speak to your experience, please? Sure. Um, my name is Omar Aitani. I'm the founder and general manager of Fabric Aid. Uh, Fabric Aid currently, although we definitely hope to operate in Palestine. We currently don't operate in Palestine. We operate in Lebanon, Jordan, UAE, and very soon Egypt. Uh, although every country is specific in its situation, but I do think that Lebanon qualified to one of the most difficult countries to operate in. So I can relate uh, to social entrepreneurs for Palestine. Uh, what we do in, in, uh, uh, in Fabricade is basically uh, focusing on secondhand clothing as a resource. We collect, we are the biggest collector of secondhand clothing in the region. We collect clothes through hundreds of clothing collection bins in Lebanon, Jordan, and UAE, and through partnerships with international fast fashion brands and international organizations. The clothes that we collect is basically uh, sorted, cleaned, and the vast majority of it is sold at micro prices, talking about less than a dollar per item, at shops we create and operate in extremely marginalized areas. The aim of those shops is to provide people with a dignified shopping experience. People come into our stores, they choose whatever they want, they have the chance to, to select the item. There's fitting rooms, price tags, uh, personalized shopping experience uh, at prices that they can afford, and most importantly, without having any charity involved. Uh, it's a proper dignified shopping experience, and uh, um, thankfully, this concept has been very successful at Fabricade. We have uh, sold more than 600,000 items to more than uh, 160,000 beneficiaries in the past couple of years. Although this is, in terms of impact, the reason why Fabricade was created, uh, but unfortunately, it created only 8% of our total revenues since the items are sold at very affordable prices. We created other brands to sustain the organization and grow it further. One of those brands is Second Base, Vintage Clothing, all the items that we receive that are a bit boho, African prints, stuff that marginalize communities who tend to be conservative, don't usually consume. We sell them at all our own vintage stores at higher price margins. And everything that cannot be sold back again at those stores, damaged, overconsumed, um, out of fashion, we upcycle it and we create from it new fashion brands uh, owned by Fabricade and sold through e-commerce and consignment stores, or merchandise that we sell directly to corporates. Um, uh, we have other concepts, but this is basically the gist of Fabricade, is looking at secondhand clothing as a resource uh, to generate uh, income for the company and to satisfy the massive market need. In the Arab world, there's 77 million people uh, who can't afford decent clothing. The aim of Fabricate is to reach all of those people to satisfy their need and to do it in a sustainable way, both for the environment uh, and in a fruitful way, an impactful way for the economy also. Uh, Omar, what, I, what you do, I absolutely love, especially the part about it being a dignified shopping experience for people. 
I mean, there's no reason why people shouldn't be able to buy a decent pair of clothes at a decent price. And also the second base idea is amazing. I'm a client. I love it. Before we jump to you, I mean, uh, Omar, can you speak a bit about how you've been able to finance Fabric Aid uh, until now? Because I think the issue of grant funding and how it can be used effectively and where the sources of grant funding um, are is very um, topical for this audience. Sure. Um, so definitely, definitely, uh, funding is one of the most complicated uh, and challenging things for social entrepreneurs in the region. And that's why uh, in the region, we don't have scalable social enter enterprises. It's not that because we don't, have, we, don't, we don't have scalable social enterprises and that's why we don't have funding. No, we don't have funding and that's why we don't have scalable social enterprises. And as Fabricate, we have suffered immensely from that. We started operations in 2018. We were two people. Today, Fabricate is more than 120 employees. So of course, to grow into, in terms of size, in terms of impact, we have 16 stores, we have several facilities, and this is growing uh, uh, day by day. We required immense funding, uh, and it was very complicated for us to get investors, uh, because for us, we have three bottom lines. It's profit, for sure, uh, people, and environment. And this is very uncommon to investors here in the region. Uh, so new, you, normal tech startups suffer in funding. So imagine social enterprises, um, because simply there is no mandate for venture capitals and tech, uh, tech investors to invest in, uh, in companies like Fabricate. And when you go to development agencies, they also don't invest in a company like Fabricate because simply Fabricate is a limited liability company. We are registered like as a limited liability company and not as a charity. They legally, most of the times, can't invest in us. So, honey, uh, because the situation is is quite complicated. For Fabricate to be able to solve this issue, we were incredibly lucky. We started by winning competitions. We won, we won like $200,000 in competitions. This allowed us to start generating decent revenues that allowed us to get the first angel investors. With the money of angel investors, we were able to uh, expand the company furthermore and get our first venture capital that invests in, um, in social enterprises uh, or in, in enterprises with impact. But for us to be able to do that, we ha we needed to resort to small grants, win competitions, get angel investors. And we were very lucky in the last minute before the company was about to die, we were able to land a venture capital. Uh, so uh, this is not a proper way to have an infrastructure and to grow social enterprises. We cannot rely on luck on the last minute. We need to have better infrastructure. Yeah, no, absolutely agreed. Amin, we'll jump to you. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about Alphanad without going into the fund yet, and also maybe defining venture philanthropy, um, as I think it would be very useful as well for people to understand that form of funding. Thank you, Mary, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this great forum. Uh, Alfanar is the first venture philanthropy organization in the Arab world. It was launched in 2004, uh, and it's currently present in Egypt, Lebanon, and Jordan, and we recently started in Palestine. Uh, so far, we have supported uh, throughout these 18 years around 100 organizations with management support and impact management. And out of the 100, around 48 have also received funding. So what we do at Alfanar, uh, or let's say venture philanthropy, uh, uh, basically takes the concepts of venture capital um, uh, in terms of uh, finance and business management, and it applies them to uh, achieving philanthropic goals, uh, essentially to increase the impact, social impact and environmental impact of the beneficiaries. And we do this in three ways, funding, management support, and impact management. Funding, when it comes to venture philanthropy, comes in the form of grants, and the way we do it is multi-year support. So uh, basically at Alfanar, we provide support over five years. And the funding we provide is actually milestone based. And it's based on a business plan. Um, we start with a pilot year. And then if the beneficiary is confirmed, there would, it would be followed up the second and the third and the fourth year. Uh, with much greater, uh, actually, funds. Um, so uh, we are much more uh, sort of uh, diligent with these beneficiaries in terms of what is their business plan, what is their impact plan, uh, how do they intend to achieve it, 
Um, uh, uh, and we provide them free of charge with the second point, which is management support to help them strengthen their business. They may need access to a quality certification. They, need, uh, they may need support in uh, uh, establishing a governance uh, structure uh, and so on. So we help them actually establish those to strengthen their business. And in addition, the third point, we provide them with impact management. So we help them to firstly understand their impact, model it, measure it, communicate on it, and most importantly, to scale it. So these are the three activities of Alphanar that we provide to uh, essentially social enterprises in the region. And uh, just to link uh, that with impact, with the impact fund that we are looking to launch at the end of the year, uh, we help those companies to become investment ready uh, uh, so that uh, they uh, sort of emancipate from uh, uh, the environment of grant funding and that they are able to attract private capital into their enterprise, which has a lot of advantages. Uh, firstly, private capital comes in much bigger scale than any grant program uh, can actually provide. Um, and, and therefore, those companies that are successful getting to the growth stage, uh, the problem in the Middle East is there is nobody there to actually be interested in both their financial prospects and their impact generation prospects. This is the funding gap that our fund and we hope other funds will come up is looking to address. It's to attract private investment into the development sector with the scale that private investors can provide. Yeah, I can see Lemma nodding because I think we all agree that it's time for us to move beyond philanthropy and aid and that there are investable, investable propositions in the region and it allows us uh, as entrepreneurs to choose the type of private investor that we want that's aligned with our values and you know, not necessarily continue to depend on highly politicized aid. Uh, Lama, does what uh, Amin uh, is describing in terms of the scope of Alphanar's work make sense in Palestine? Or do you think the social enterprises are already investor ready? Or is there work that needs to be done to prepare them for that? Well, I think there, there is still a lot of work to be done to make social enterprises impact, in, yeah, investment ready. I, I can think of you now, and actually thanks to Alphanar and their latest program in Palestine, it's also helping few of the organizations and, and social enterprises to become uh, investment ready. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is why we're discussing now this now, because I can see some of them becoming investment ready very soon. Uh, this is thanks to all the work that has been done on the ground. Um, and I also want to stress the, the point that you just mentioned, uh, Mary, is that I think why this is even more important in Palestine, because donor aid is highly, I, I lost my English now, it's very, it has very uh, harsh political agenda behind it. And I've seen it multiple times where some of even tech startups, their, their, their investment was withdrawn because of their political views. So this is really destructive for us as Palestinians. And this is why, as Amin, meant, uh, Amin mentioned in this format, the private capital that comes from people who align with your values is so important for us, especially in Palestine, because of the context, context and all the situation. So definitely, um, I think there is a lot of work that should be done. Um, and as I mentioned, there is really lack of support to these social enterprises. Now we see some of the, the funders and the donors coming, like, coming up with new programs to support social enterprises in Palestine. I am happy for that, but I'm also very careful uh, with what is what is being presented and not to you know, uh, emphasize, I, I really don't want to see these programs coming in with more aid and more grants to support social enterprises, which will only uh, lead to creation of enterprises that will fail eventually because there is no follow-up uh, uh, programs and there is no follow-up uh, support that is being provided, which was the case with most of the programs in the in the past. Uh, and this is why I think this fund has to be, you know, controlled by private sector Palestinians uh, with no hidden agenda, no political agenda uh, behind. 
Uh, Lemma, I'm curious because you mentioned before that, you know, obviously we've highlighted a lot of social enterprises in this conference and you were saying how there's very um, inspiring, innovative solutions coming out of Gaza. Just in case there are investors sort of watching this, I'm wondering, maybe you can describe some of these enterprises um, or potentially talk about the sectors that you think are exciting in Palestine, maybe beyond tech. I know there's a lot of tech happening. Um, and I understand why, for obvious reasons, um, given the political situation. But maybe you can just highlight a little bit of that. Of course. Um, so actually, we just had one, you know, Atfaluna was one of the organizations in the previous panel, which they have the store with products made by people who have uh, who have issues. So this is a really good example from Gaza that is not tech based, but also is, I think, investment ready at this moment. Uh, from Gaza, we work with multiple projects. Uh, some of them are tech-based, some, some of them are not. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, yeah, go to the expo area and really uh, check out these, these projects. One of my favorites is the, the mushroom farm uh, because it really helps uh, people access more protein in Gaza. There is a really food security issue happening currently. And Ahmed al Hajin was one of the speakers. Actually, he's going to speak in the next panel, so you should all uh, look up for the story. He reinvented how mushroom is planted to, to be controlled all in Gaza, and he kicked out Israeli mushroom out of the market. Uh, so this was like, I think a great uh, success in Gaza. Uh, we also have some, I actually also like tech-based social enterprises because they're scalable. Uh, so we have Hanadi who re-engineered a whole, uh, the, the system that we use to dry food she re-engineered it so it works on solar panels instead of electricity because of the electricity issue in Gaza. And this to preserve all the food that's being thrown and needed at the same time because of lack of electricity. And the, her innovation is very scalable. And she restructured all and manufactured it in Gaza. Uh, imagine if she was somewhere else, she would be now managing a, a factory. But only because she's in Gaza, it is really hard for her to, to manufacture. It's so expensive. It's hard for her to export from Gaza. And now she's now, ex we're now exploring with her what if she, uh, you know, works on the, the patent itself and if she can manufacture out, so outside Gaza. So we have always to play around with these, the business model, the, 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 the whole business on how to, to you know, uh, break that wall and scale the impact. Uh, but we, you know, we still have to work on it. And we still have to innovate in the business model itself, so it works. Yeah, thank you. I got goosebumps when you're talking about that last company. Uh, I would love to be in touch with her, by the way, if I can support in any way. Um, thank you. So I mentioned in the introduction that Omar wants to flip the script, um, and I'd like to talk about that. And uh, one of the reasons why I think what Omar is about to say is so exciting is because uh, we're seeing in the region that there's a lot of startups that are really following sort of the Western VC model of, you know, scale and exit, scale and exit. So obviously some of the value in situations like that tends to dis dissipate or disappear, whereas Omar has a different view. And um, I think maybe when answering this question, Omar, you can also talk about the why, you know, why you're doing this. Um, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um... So honestly, in the region in, in, in general, um, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, Gaza is an extreme uh, example, but uh, all over the region, we have um, uh, situations that are not solved and people are looking for solutions. And since the governmental sector and the public sector in most of those countries is neither absent or incompetent or corrupt or altogether, uh, hence Lebanon case, um, uh, it's very it's very tough to expect a solution coming from anywhere other than social enterprises. And here, uh, I'm not only talking about the uh, the social and environmental aspects um, and the opportunities we have as social and uh, social entrepreneurs from an environmental and social aspect. I'm also talking about the economic opportunities. Uh, since those issues are scalable and the Arab world is massive in size. Example, our the problem that we are trying to solve, the clothing problem. There are 77 million Arabs who can't afford decent clothing. And I'm not talking about, you know, they cannot afford Zara and H&M. I'm talking about those people who cannot afford um, uh, affordable, uh, fast fashion that comes from Southern Asia, uh, China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and India. There are 77 million of those. 
So I think here there's an economic opportunity for us to capitalize on uh, the most underprivileged communities in the Arab world. And there's an opportunity to create businesses focusing on the uh, uh, on this uh, uh, chunk of society. What we see, unfortunately, in the Arab world, that most startups, most investments, most money, most talent, most innovative business models and technologies are going to solve the issues of those who are privileged uh, in the Arab world and those who can afford. And usually those who are privileged and can afford have the same problems that people in the US are facing and people in the Europe are facing and people in uh, in Asia are facing. The predicament here is that uh, if you are developing a solution for this uh, se- uh, section of society in Silicon Valley and you are developing it also in Dubai, the chances that you will fix it faster, more scalably and more effectively is that the Silicon Valley startup will fix it better simply because there's a bigger infrastructure, bigger market, bigger, uh, uh, a bigger amount of cash. Our opportunity here in the region, and this is what I pitch to investors and I'm and why I'm hoping we can get some those of tech investors and venture capitals that are currently existing to, the, to diversify their portfolio and invest more in social enterprises. So there's two ways around it. We can create impact funds and we can push more the existing venture capital funds to invest more in impact startup, which is our case. And I think the, the value that we can bring is that we can have social enterprises in the region that scale and become international and open up in Nigeria and Bangladesh and India, while uh, traditional solution, tech solutions that uh, 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 cater for the privileged communities, their biggest ambition is to be acquired. I look at the biggest examples we have in the Arab world. Kareem, acquired by Uber. Uh, Sue, acquired by Amazon. Property Finders, um, Angami, uh, Swivel. All our big tech startups and the most successful ones were acquired. In social enterprises, we have the potential to build enterprises in the region that become uh, successful enough to go and acquire startups outside of the region. So it's a huge shift in the mentality. And we really have an opportunity to do that because the 77 million people in the Arab world who can't afford decent clothing, they are around 600 million in Africa who can't afford decent clothing. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. That's amazing. I mean, I mean, clearly Al-Fanar has built an impact fund recently because they see the opportunity that Omar is speaking about. Can you tell us a bit about how you designed the fund? Because I think if Lama and other Palestinian entrepreneurs are thinking of building their own impact fund, it would be very useful for them to hear about your experience because it's that intentionality that drives the design of a fund that you know you and I have both gone through for the past couple of years that really can make the fund successful or not. So please tell us about it. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Omar, for your insight. Um, uh, so. Al-Fanar, having been very, very active in venture philanthropy for 18 years in the region, we have come up with the sad realization that actually once we get uh, a number of social enterprises to be investment ready and they get to the growth stage, i.e. the stage where they need significantly more capital to uh, continue growing, they need to invest in production capacity, they need to invest in equipment, they need to invest in marketing, accessing new markets, etc. When they get to that stage, there are no literally or very few investors that are willing to, uh, to, to entrust them with their funds, either because they don't value their impact um, uh, or because they are not convinced with the solidity of their business model. So we are launching a fund at the end of the year, which is a a MENA region impact fund, Middle East, North Africa, with $50 million in size that will support companies in the growth stage. We believe that in the region, we have enough accelerator programs, incubator programs, angel investment programs, and so on to handle those companies until the growth stage. But once they reach the growth stage, there's a funding gap that we are looking to cover. This is part of our mission and our investment strategy. There may be other impact funds that come up that focus on a different part of the cycle, but our fund focuses on growth stage. Now, uh, uh, just to give you a bit of a positive um, uh, element here, impact investing 
uh, which in two words has two prerequisites. One is the intention to generate a financial return on investment. So these are not grants, it's not charity, it's investments that can be equity or credit or other forms. And the second prerequisite is the intention to generate a measurable and scalable impact. Um, so uh, impact investing has been growing significantly everywhere in the world. It has gone from $50 billion in 2009 to around seven, over $700 billion globally. The bad thing is that our region, the MENA region, is the last in class. We haven't been able to actually grow our part of that uh, pie. Of that pie. Uh, um, and, and there are many reasons for this, but we feel that the region has a lot of potential to catch up with the rest of the world because of the increased interest of investors to attach an impact uh, uh, element to their investments. Um, so we feel that that change is coming, and it's coming mostly from the existence on the ground of uh, a number of very creative social entrepreneurs that can actually solve problems, like Omar said, that nobody else is actually solving. They are experts in solving problems. And those entrepreneurs that are actually solving or contributing to solving these problems that are also successful in creating a, a viable economic model to solve these problems are candidates for impact investment. So uh, we are seeing this on the ground. Sometimes we feel that they need a little push in order to get there. We can provide that support in terms of management support and impact management to help them get there, either with venture philanthropy or with you know, an impact investment. Uh, and that little push is what it takes in order to be credible when talking to those impact investors that are growing globally and hopefully soon in the region. No, thank you, Amin. Yes, I think you make a very important point uh, that MENA, actually after Oceana, receives the least amount of impact capital uh, globally. So that goes to the point that I was making in the introduction that you have these big impact investment forums like the GSG or the GIN, and simply there's no Palestinian voices there except, I mean, I've spoken there a few times. I just want to remind the audience that we're waiting for your questions. I'd love to weave them in. We don't have too much time left, and this is a really important opportunity to hear from the panelists on uh, any questions that you have. Uh, Omar, I want to go to you because Amin was talking about the importance of measurable impact, you know, if you're going to attract an impact investor. So I just want the audience to hear from you what sort of impact metrics that Fabric Aid is currently tracking. Sure. So uh, we track several metrics that usually uh, interest investors, impact investors, and traditional investors. Uh, one of them is the amount of growth collected. Uh, this is very important to us because we are structuring the company to become the biggest collector of secondhand clothing. And we consider the more clothes we collect, the more clothes we have our, on our balance sheet. And the more clothes we are uh, making sure is not ending in landfills. So it's uh, just by collecting clothes, we are benefiting the environment and benefiting the company profit-wise uh, profit and uh, balance sheet-wise. That's one aspect. Second is how many customers come to our stores, uh, the stores located in marginalized areas, the number of items we sell at those stores, uh, carbon footprint. We have done the ESG assessment to see for every kilogram of clothes we recycle, how much are we reducing car the, the carbon footprint? And of course, there's the financial metrics. Uh, the number of uh, uh, revenues generated, the multiple, the margins. Uh, there's, uh, of course, a, a both an economic and a social metric, which is the number of jobs created. So we pride ourselves to, that we have created 120 jobs. And in the same time, we have 40, 50 people who work to us on a wage basis, on a, on a part-time basis. Uh, and I personally see the growth of Fabricade uh, by being a company that, inshallah, potentially down the line, uh, would be recruiting tens of thousands of people. Uh, Lama, when designing uh, your impact fund, uh, do you think the social enterprises that you're working with are capable now to put sort of impact metrics in place? I know we talked about them needing support in terms of getting investor ready, but in terms of this IMM uh, capacity building, do you think this would be important as well? 
Absolutely. And this is one of the modules that we really emphasize on in our fellowship program. So none of our companies, you know, graduate the fellowship program without an impact framework and theory of change and to start to dig deep on uh, following up on their impact and measuring their impact. Still, there is a lot of work to be done in this area again, uh, but it's definitely something that we focus on. And I think, yeah, and to be honest, now for, for now, I think we're just opening their eyes on this, this field of impact measurement, which is really big. Uh, but it's definitely something that we're focusing on and we need to focus on more in the future to make them more impact uh, impact ready. Uh, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, maybe our vision for the impact fund that we're imagining now. And I'm, I'm, I'm also here a learner as the rest of the attendees because we're also new to this at, at, at Palestine. And I just wanted to mention why we're thinking about it in the first place. Um, so at Build Palestine, we work, with, we work a lot on awareness, like inspiring people, to make change. This summit is one of the actions that we do to inspire people to take action and start think of, thinking of innovative solutions for social and environmental challenges around them. And we also, when we work with social entrepreneurs, we, we help them upskill, network, and fundraise. And I think so far we've done the first and the second one relatively very well, I hope so. So we do a lot of the capacity building, we connect our social entrepreneurs with, with experts, with supporters from around, around the world, and we, you know, we talk about them all the time. However, when it comes to fundraise, I think we have been doing crowdfunding very well at Build Palestine, but it is not suitable for social enterprises at this stage. We've been doing crowdfunding with charities, with really big organizations and organizations with relatively good networks, and we've raised over $600,000 for organizations in Palestine. But to be super frank, this is not, uh, crowdfunding is not always, um, you know, relevant and good for social enterprises because they don't have enough networks, the capacities and the knowledge to uh, raise enough funding to help them scale. And this is why when we were looking at this fundraise, here when we stumbled around upon uh, impact investing, this is the missing piece that social entrepreneurs need and will need more in the future in Palestine to help them when they validate their impact and they know their impact metrics and what they need to follow. They need, as Amin mentioned, capital, really big capital, like to help them, you know, scale to uh, in Palestine and also outside Palestine. Um, and we still don't know what this format would look like. We don't, still don't know what this impact fund looks like, but I'm inviting anyone who's listening now and interested to be part of this to talk to us. Thank, Thank you. you. And, you know, I'm happy to support in this uh, stage as well. But I think, you know, one of the important things, uh, Lama, to keep in mind is that we really need to be taking advantage of blended finance and innovative finance at the fund level. So that means just in very basic terms that you have different types of capital in the fund, which is often used to de-risk any investor. So let's say you do have a private investor from Chile, a family office, Palestinians, uh, you know, who want to invest. They may need some subordinate capital to uh, de-risk their investment. And I know that's something that Amin and al Fanad have, you know, uh, been thinking about. Maybe you can take us through how you incorporated that blending. Um, and we just have a couple of minutes left. So if you can just keep your comments quite brief. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Is this for me or for Lama? Sorry. It's for you to advise us how to blend. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, one, one sentence is actually very popular at the moment, which is blending is trending. Uh, a lot of development agencies uh, around the world uh, are increasingly looking at how to support mechanisms that attract private capital into the impact world. And uh, 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 one of the findings of all the uh, you know, uh, initiatives that have been uh, explored uh, has been uh, done with an intention to remove those beneficiaries from eternal cycles of dependency. By getting private investors into these initiatives, uh, in a way they are investing in the sustainability of the beneficiaries, sustainability from the goods and services that they sell that actually help to fund their social or environmental activities. So uh, how do we blend? Blending can be done in a number of ways. Essentially, uh, uh, what we are looking at is taking development funds uh, that are not seeking any return, that are only there 
that are only there for the impact that is likely to be generated. So take these funds and use them to de-risk the impact funds or the initiatives that actually are seeking for a return. So uh, in a way, uh, they are improving the economics of these for-profit ventures that are very good without the blended finance part, but that need a little push to convince private investors to step in. This little push can be done by reducing the financial risk of those private investors into, uh, you know, into these investments. So what we have done at Alfanar with the support, uh, sorry, at Lyft Ventures, the impact fund that we are launching with the support of USAID, the TIF program, is a catalytic grant which um, would absorb essentially for a portion of our investments, the catalytic grant would absorb the first part of potential losses that we make in our investments. And uh, if we make returns, um, our, uh, our donor uh, would, uh, would let go of their share of the returns and distribute it evenly to the other investors, the financial investors in the fund. So if we don't do well, this uh, catalytic grant absorbs the first portion of the losses. And if you make benefits, the return of private investors will be slightly increased. Yeah. That's so useful. And clearly, clearly, we need a lot more time to go into the details of this. But thankfully, Lema is just in the beginning stages of designing the impact fund. So I think definitely we need to have a conversation about this blended finance tool that we can use to attract more investors. So on that note, I have to close the panel by saying thank you to everyone watching. Thank you, Lema. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Amin. I think it's clear that we all need to be acting together to build an impact economy for Palestine and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, Amin, Omar, and Lama. It's true funding remains one of the top barriers to sustainability and scaling impact for social enterprises. Besides that, the investment fund for Palestine would uh, represent an important step forward for the social innovation sector. Thank you very much. Thanks. And since we were just talking about social enterprises now, we will share the story of Salah Hassadi from Gaza, the founder of the uh, Blue Filter. Make sure to visit their booth in the expo area to connect uh, with Salah and enjoy. <laughs> 